Um, my name's Chris Church, like it says here. I live in Oxford, but I did live in Hackney in London for 28 years till last year. Um, I started out with the friends here way back in the you know, late Carboniferous now. Um, but having worked with Friends of the Earth Group Network for many years, I increasingly realised that we weren't actually getting out to as wide an audience as we might want. And one of the things that really interested me about today, tomorrow, was the idea of diversity and how we actually diversify. Please, please come in. Yeah. 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 Any more for any more? Yes. Yeah. Just starting. Oh, okay. I'm afraid you. Missed your chance to introduce yourself. <laughs> Grab a seat. Yeah. Sorry, it's not the ideal focus, not the ideal right on suitably working around tables in big circles, but that's the universal for you. So, community development, how we work with people to change places change their lives, maybe. It's a kind of critical time. Anyone who's been involved in working on climate for the last three or four years will know we've been in a trough. Around about 2009, we had the UK Climate Act, we had Kevin Hogan as a major rallying point and a complete disappointment, and since then, it's been a bit of a trough. The optimists will say the floods and the extreme weather <coughs> and the railway lines being washed out have started to put climate back on the agenda. But we're not really getting anywhere fast enough. I'm sure most people here have come here today thinking that. And I'd say one of the key points is that we need to get more people and communities involved because we need every last bit of skills and resources we can mobilise if we are really going to transform. So, what do we need? Why are people and communities important? Well, let me suggest that any long-term change needs policies, infrastructure, and engagement. And I think if you're an old-style Western politician, or even Eastern <coughs> politician, we still have those, you think policy. We pass a policy, local government and the private sector deliver the infrastructure, and well-paid citizens get engaged and do it. Traditional model of change. And if you took something like seatbelts, when seatbelts came in, government passed the law, car companies did it, by and large people put seatbelts on. But if you look at stuff like recycling, in the UK we got policy, thanks to Europe largely, don't tell you it, <laughs> um, was the European direction. And of course millions of people said, yeah, that makes perfect sense to me. But actually not a lot happened for a few years. Uh, because there wasn't the infrastructure. There was all these ridiculous stories of people getting into their Volvos and driving 20 miles to put bottles in a bottle bank. Um, local food, last few years. Five, ten years ago, a lot of people said, why are my children getting fed from big shit at school? Why can't I buy fresh food? Huge upsurge and rapid growth. People suddenly start taking over land, repurposing allotments, a whole bunch of growth in communities. And it was only after about five years of that that you actually got policy change that made that help that happen. So actually, that traditional model is actually quite a lot more complicated. And at the moment in Britain, we've got some that. Nowhere near enough. We haven't got the enabling stuff to go with it. We've got quite a lot of us, not as much as we need, and we've got a growing but wholly inadequate local government. And for all that, will only happen if we get people engaged. Is that fair enough? We need the people to put the pressure on for the policy. Now, let me be a little controversial. Hands up anyone who's ever seen that quote from Margaret Mead. Never doubt a small bunch of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. It's great. I found that I remember finding out that in about 1985, and thinking, great. Only, I think it's wrong. Why do I think it's wrong? It's a great way to get rebellion started. Small group of people. But a rebellion is a revolution that has to succeed. And we need to succeed. And actually, we need a large group of committed people. They may not have to be completely committed. But 
that if we get, it's very easy for small groups of people to look at that top thing and think, yeah, we're going to change the world. Actually, we can start, but if we're seriously going to finish, suffragettes vote for women in prison. Small groups for really motivated, committed people. Ten years later, huge national movement. Anti-slavery, three or four trendy lefty clerics in South London and a few other places saying slavery is a bad idea. Ten years later, huge national campaign. Small things start when you need big things to finish. And it's dangerous, I think, to actually think that just small groups of us can do this. It may be great for our media, but frankly that's not good enough, I don't think. So, if we're going to build engagement, I would suggest one of the key principles that came up in the last session to the energy to start where people are. Unfortunately, it's not always clear. Um, we can think we can make all sorts of assumptions. We can do some questionnaires. But if we get those wrong, because we haven't actually gone out and talked to people properly. And it's also very easy, and there's various suggestions at the moment about how we classify people into, you know, environmentally minded or inwardly looking or outwardly looking. My impression is that people are actually a bit more complicated than that. And um, <coughs> if we get it wrong, it can set us back. So where do people stand? Let me suggest to you that everyone in here, everyone on earth, is somewhere on this chart. In fact, everyone in this room has turned up here on a Saturday. You're all up here, engaged and convinced. Is that fair? Mm. Anyone feel a little sceptical about climate change? I <laughs> couldn't <laughs> <laughs> imagine so. Some of you may not be here today because you'd like to be here, but actually you're halfway up a tree and you're doing your allotment and you're writing your you know, master work on climate change. People way up there. Now, why am I putting this up? Because if we really want that major change, we need everyone to be at least a little bit engaged and a little bit convinced. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. Now, traditional climate change stuff, and I got all some talk this morning about working the enemy, kind of tended to say that the enemy, over here maybe, yeah. engaged and sceptical. Is that fair? The people who will argue till you're blue in the face. There are loads of websites about how to argue with climate sceptics. Anyone see one? They're all out there. But actually, a number of people who are actively engaged, and of course, yeah, they write to the Daily Telegraph and the Spectator, and they are the power behind a lot of the, you know, <coughs> the nastiest people in the engaged and sceptical are probably the people who think that climate change will kill the poorest billion. And if you're in the richest billion, that's great. We shouldn't forget there are plenty of people out there in the white air side of the right wing think tanks who think that's a good idea. But actually, getting them convinced is a slow process. Anyone reckon they've changed a skeptic's mind lately? Can you run into some sort of occasion? But a friend of mine's a professor in Imperial. She spent five years trying to work on Lord Moncton and thought she was getting somewhere until he, until he refused to answer her calls. We continued writing the same old lies. The reason I'm putting this up, though, is that I think there are millions of people waiting to get engaged, who are down here, convinced but uninterested and engaged. They see David Attenborough's stuff on television about climate change. They're not stupid. They can see what's happening. The question for us is why aren't they up here? Why are there millions, and there are millions of them? You know, they're our friends. They're people who all going off to that wacky event. But don't tell us all about it too long in the pub afterwards. Because, you know. But, and the reason for stressing this is that the journey from here to here is about changing minds. The journey from here to here is completely different. And I really think that an awful lot of the climate movement is still kind of stuck on if we can only convince all the people who don't believe us to believe us, then it will be alright. Yeah. Whereas actually, we need to convince the people who do believe us to actually get off their butts and do something. <laughs> and that's a different thing. And of course, there are still a lot of people down here. And one of our jobs, I would suggest to you, is to make sure the poisons 
dripping down from here doesn't put those people into the skeptical. It does give, we need, but the journey is probably something like this, rather than something like that. We're all on that journey. Probably 10, 20 years, 30 years ago in some cases, most of us were in a different position to where we are now. Some of you may not be born. But the journey, and if we're going to understand where people, how we, we're talking about change in people's minds, we need to understand their existing concerns. What's the local context? What have we got to work with, and what are the constraints? And I think one of the things we sometimes get confused if we're talking about engagement is the difference between personal and community. And I'm here consciously to talk about community. But let's just think for a minute about personal engagement. We use this word engagement a lot, yeah? I'm sure quite a lot of us have a fine time to. And let me suggest that what we're actually trying to do is move people from a position where they are aware. Now, go back to that last question. Millions and millions of people are aware. Climate change is a big problem, it's something that needs to be done. What they are not, they have not taken the step from awareness to engagement. For me, engagement is when actually I should do something about this. You know, I'm aware of the problem. I'm aware of lots of problems in the world. If I tried to be engaged with all of them, my brain would explode. So I'm going to choose to be engaged with this one. And there are millions of people who reckon they're engaged, but are not active. Awareness, engagement, action. We all do this all the time. Anyone here smoke? <coughs> yeah, what, what? Can't find a smoker, I don't think, these days. Who isn't aware? that smoking is bad thing. That's serious denial. Much harder than climate. So, millions of people are aware that it's bad for them. Quite a lot of them are saying, yeah, I should give up, or I should cut down. That's being engaged. But lo and behold, they haven't done it. My doctor tells me I should lose a few kilos. This be a heart attack in my family. I'm fully engaged with that. I should do that. But I haven't been on that bicycle for about two weeks. I'm not being active. And it's very easy, I think, for people to be aware, engaged, and not active. And I think the key point is that some, we are still, in many cases, pumping out messages aware, about awareness, or maybe about engagement, without giving people cogent, message, clear messages about what they can do, how. And that's got to go beyond turning the lights off. You know, that kind of crap. Sorry. You know, the small changes. Mm. And one of the ways I would suggest to do this is by working with people who other people trust. We have historically quite low levels of trust in Britain. There was a European wide survey a few years ago by Eurobarometer, who do opinion polls right across Europe, to get out. <laughs> survey of environmental awareness around about 2011. They asked people who you trust. You know, you have a tick box thing, loads of names. And at the bottom of all these things like MPs, TV, newspapers, NGOs, scientists, there was a thing that said none of the above. And in Germany, 2% took none of the above. Most Germans trusted someone to give them good environmental information. Same in France, Netherlands, Holland, Poland, sorry, Portugal, 7% took none of the above. I might see where this is going. In the UK, 16% didn't trust anyone to give them good environmental information. Why is that? Media. Media? Class system. Class system? We can have all sorts of interesting reasons why. One of them, I think, is the sheer overload. And the fact that so many different people can so many different messages. I don't know. But it's there. So, one of the things that people did trust, one of the groups that people did trust, was people in their own communities. The problem with that is the classic phrase, oh, a man in the pub told me all that time and changed stuff was a load of rubbish. Um, that's a very traditional kind of British approach. But actually, there's some value in this because people do trust. If a local priest, you go to church regularly, or the mosque, and your priest or your imam tells you this is something we should do, you're probably much more likely to do it than if you get leaders in your local MP or your local council. 
and helping individuals and consumers. Now, anyone who's at Jamie's workshop from the Simon Outreach Information Network, come on. Yeah. Quite a lot of stuff in there about what we have, what we value. And a slightly different approach, because when I talk to people, it tends to be stuff about my future, my family, my income. But when you get people talking in a group, then it's my neighbourhood, my society, and hopefully our shared future. How do we get the how do we get the dialogue moving from the my stuff to the our stuff? And why should we worry about this? The Department for Energy and Climate Change, DEC. They had a big argument a few years ago. Anyone come across the Green Deal? Yeah, yeah, some people, yeah, some people are laughing about the government's energy <laughs> initiative. And quite a lot of community groups have got involved in promoting that. But the people, so a lot of the government's advisors said, why do all that? Community groups are stroppy, they don't do what they're told, they've got their own agendas. Um, why don't we just have stalls, displays, in the entrance of every Tesco, every Waitrose, and every Aldi, and so on. Just go to individual consumers at the moment they're consuming. Well, actually, there are very good reasons. There's plenty of research that says, actually, if you get people working together locally, they'll deliver greater levels of change. They can share their concerns. They can talk to their mates. So, any other reasons we should focus on community and collective action? Great change, change in terms. Anything else we can do? It's fun. It's fun, absolutely. Why do people get involved in local environmental groups, local climate groups? Certain amount of meet interesting people like that and have fun. Things done by one community can be replicated in another community. Absolutely. We can we're replicable. Um, do you have to see things change on a local level? We can actually see some real change, absolutely. If one of us does it, well, we can see our own change, but no one else notices. If a lot of us are doing it together, it's on a bigger scale and it's much more visible. And actually, there are an awful lot of people who don't believe that anything is possible. That's really important. So, I've used this word community a lot. And let's just remember that it's kind of complicated. And I don't want to get banging on about this too long. But people have got a lot of different thoughts here. And I'm not going to hang on to that for long. So just to remind us, so yeah, the previous workshop in here actually was talking a lot about consultation and people using the services. But in many cases, communities and groups are actually doing stuff themselves independently. They're delivering services, and in some cases, they're working together as long-term partners. But this is probably the hardest question in this list. What do we actually mean by community? Government has community strategies. The European communities. It's us, that's easy. My village. There are an awful lot of communities, and you'll find plenty of community communities where you keep it popular. Because there, we've got more around our community. And so the community is always defined by the people who aren't in our community. And that's, you know, a dangerous one. But usually, small, well defined localities to people in But actually, that we need to go to certain ones. It's easy to look at communities' place, and it's easy to look at communities' interests. What's the largest community of interest in the world? The Sorry? The global, the global population. There's an interesting one. Okay. Anyone else got slightly smaller? Religion. Sorry? Religion. Religion. Though, which which Facebook group claims to have members <coughs> in 200 nations? <laughs> Manchester United Fan Club. <laughs> <laughs> community of interest? Is it actually a community? Interesting. I mean, in this day and age, there's some interesting stuff here. And sometimes we forget that some people really, really care about community. But sometimes they don't. Sometimes it's, there's a lot of work, I'm going to talk a little bit about the work on faiths. And I've talked to a lot of young Muslim men who said, well, I go to prayers, but actually that's because we don't go over shit, so I didn't. Um, there's plenty of people in the Christian faith who go to church because it's the thing to do. Doesn't necessarily mean it's an identity. If we're talking to people, making assumptions about what defines
find to their identity, to their interest. If we haven't done some work, it's difficult. So let me suggest that there's one important <coughs> missing in a lot of when people talk about engaging local people. A yeah, community is a group of people with something in common, and that can be a belief or a place or a purpose or a need. Strong user groups in the health sector, people who are defining diseases. But they're uh, people who want to work with or be identified as. Just to suggest that Upper Clapton in Hackney is a community is rubbish. It's a whole bunch of overlapping communities. And a lot of the people in it who ended up there from another country, they've been dumped there by social housing, they don't know anyone, they just want to go somewhere else. They're not part of that community. So, I was asked to talk about diversity. I'm not going to go on this. If anyone wants copies of this, I can send it to you afterwards. Come and give me your email. But the starting point for any community, I suspect, is working with what's there. And I think the biggest problem for a lot of environmental campaigns is the tendency to go barreling in and think that people are going to listen because it's important. That's called preaching. And by and large, a lot of people don't like to preach now. And I think we are a, we, there is a certain feeling that when you've got something that is really important, you care a lot about, it is very easy to preach. I was working with the East London Mosque a few years ago on climate change. And I was saying to him, and they were getting interested. There's some interesting people there doing some interesting stuff. But about two years before that, another major environmental group had done a very high profile set of public events with faith groups in London. And I said, didn't you have a meeting here about two years ago? And they said, oh, was that about climate change? These two really weird people came, and they spoke very, very fast for about 15 minutes about how all this global stuff was really important. And a lot of people in the mosque got very cross because they thought they let evangelical Christians in. But <laughs> <laughs> was that same event that they described as a bunch of evangelical Christians coming in was described by the environmental organisation as a huge breakthrough in tackling climate change. We're not very good sometimes at understanding what is there. And if there's one thing before thinking that you can actually go out and engage with any community, what's already there? Why is it there? Who's doing it? And if we've got concern, there's a fair chance that any organised community has come together around their concerns about the future of their children, their neighbourhood, their family, whatever, or their environment. Sometimes it's quite hard to look at the strands, the strings, that tie us to them. But I would put it to you that if you can't find those strands, then you're going to find it really hard to build any kind of relationship. And the, the time spent understanding what people do and being clear <coughs> on what they've got to offer the community you're trying to engage with. Um, this is the hardest thing I usually find in starting with any new community. And I do a lot of work that isn't environmental, that is quite simply about community development. So, diversity, hard to reach. Anyone come across this phrase, hard to reach? Local councils have lists of hard to reach groups. We were working in another part of East London, or the park, and the council said, we want you to engage with hard to reach groups. So we had to go with this list. And we found that the list was completely wrong, out of date, all sorts of stuff. And but once we started getting to talk to groups, the Somali women's group said, Oh, do you know the Ghanaian women's group? And we said, No, they're not on the list. So eventually, after about two or three phone calls and an email and a meeting with someone, my colleague Jane, but she got invited to meet Ghanaian women. And this is when we put a question mark in the front. Because the Ghanaian women said, the council called us hard to reach them. And she said, yeah, you're on my list, hard to reach groups. We've been meeting in this room on the second Tuesday, at the same time in the evening, for the last five years. How hard would that be? <laughs> we retitled it, not trying very hard to reach. There is a very often a race of reason. Yes. You say you each have five staff, now we've got half a staff who's suddenly doing oh. five people's job. Absolutely. I'm not going to blame anyone here. But there is an endemic problem that it's too easy 
to say a group is hard to reach. Now, people, very hard to reach sometimes. And that's another reason for working with communities. There are plenty of people who will not answer the door if you get door knocking. And uh, Ashin in the previous session was talking about door knocking as a way of getting people involved. And it works for some people. But there's an awful lot of cultures and there's an awful lot of single women, young and old, who won't answer the door if someone comes knocking. Quite hard to get to individuals. How many times has someone tried to harass you for five minutes while walking through a major station to sign up for Friends of the Earth <laughs> or Christian Aid or Shelter or... You know, we're all good at kind of navigating past some of those things. Um, individuals, hard to reach. But if the individual has come out and said, actually, I'm in a sports club, book club, I go to church, I go to a mosque, I go to the synagogue, there's a way to get them. And that's one reason why I would suggest that working with communities it's another good reason to get far more people with the same effort. And within all that, I've kept talking about faith groups, and minorities, and one of the panic charges for today was about diversifying faith. And then anyone came because they thought that word diversify is really important, or whether you could that was one reason why I was interested. Getting to diverse groups is usually not just done for one issue. So we've got a slightly different focus. We're trying to engage people around climate. But then again, we've got climate, we've got tar sands, we've got fracking, we've got a whole bunch of issues. And we may not be wanting to go out and start climate. But I think there is a, still a risk that people plunge in and fail to talk to, for instance, the community leaders. Understanding it takes a hell of a long time. We've done the work we did with the East London mosques. We banged our head against the wall for about three or four months, ringing people up, they never got back, emailing people. Finally, we found one preacher who was actually said to give his own green business and could see that was locked in it to him to help us. You know, we were able to help him, he helped us. Finally, entering point. And of course, within that one Muslim community, which stretched across two boroughs, there were easily four or five subgroups. Women was a very important one. My colleague Jan was invited along to women's room in one of the larger mosques. Um, usually they're crisis. Everyone's sitting on cushions. In the middle, one steel frame chair. And she said, who's going to sit there? They said, oh, you are. And she said, why? Is it? Well, we, we know that white women don't like to sit on the floor. We all make assumptions about other people all the time. And actually, that's one reason why we want to talk to people and understand it. Because often, it's black nation community. But it's also faith, disability, age, gender. Um, I haven't seen much in the way of a gay politics take on climate change. But I'd love to hear if there is one. Um, do the two have, is there an overlap? There was certainly a very strong gay conservation movement years ago, because a lot of gay people who cared about local conservation found a lot of conservation groups were so full of bearded middle-aged men who weren't very good at working with gay people, and they felt we actually need to start defining our own space here. Age is a big one. I gather there was a discussion this morning about how the climate change movement is fractured into younger radicals and grumpy, grey-haired middle-aged men. Um, like you. Um, how do we overcome all this? I think we need to recognise what's being done. And let me give you, towards the end, three key issues. Connection, communication, crew. Connection. One of the hardest things if we're talking about diversifying the community, climate change movement, is actually quite simply making that connection. Um, George Marshall, one of the founders of the coin, I think recently wrote something about how he would often like to try and make connections with individuals by talking to them when he sat next to them on the bus about climate change. I'm not sure about him, but if someone came up to me and started talking to me on the bus about climate change, I wouldn't necessarily see that as the start of a useful relationship. <laughs> um, building the trust and acceptance, find a way in. We haven't got time to do much of this. You know, we're three years away from irretrievable tipping point. There's all sorts of reasons why we don't spend the time doing this, to start the conversation. But one of the big problems, I think, is that people think 
but it's quite easy to get out there and broaden the structure of our organisation or our campaign. But we still focus on what will happen once we've done that, rather than how we do it. We don't budget three months for proper building proper engagement. We don't budget the time or the money or the staff because there's higher priorities. We somehow assume this is going to happen. Now, that's a local council holding a bodged consultation exercise about a local piece of regeneration. People get cross. Local council, I mean, the local planner said to me, God, I don't know how you do this. So I've got to go to a community meeting, he said, about contentious development. I've got to sit on a platform 45 minutes while people scream at me. Now, that is almost a perfect example of how not to do public consultation. And I did want to suggest to him that perhaps he shouldn't go, because by going, he would probably make things worse. But if we don't plan this stuff in, and the communication, you know, we all tend to be very helpful. Sorry to interrupt. You look very pretty, we're going to let you know. You've been allowed to have a few properties upstairs in the foyer for 15 minutes, because people are saying we're not getting enough liquid when we finish, so of course it is. We're just going yeah, to tell yeah. people we've got 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Please go to okay. get a few coffee upstairs. We're going to take a massive group photo on the steps opposite while the sun is still out. Please come join us. Enjoy <laughs> <laughs> okay. Final two or three points. Communication. <coughs> You're not sure. If you're dealing with communities you don't know, whether they're elderly people, young people, religious groups, whatever, people are overwhelmingly welcoming. If someone comes to you and says, I'm not quite sure how your group works, of course we spent five minutes explaining it, I hope. But sometimes we're scared. Will it make us sound like idiots? Shouldn't we know what the group we're trying to reach out to is? And above all, respecting what's already going on. But finally, I think we know by now that lots of traditional stuff, there's great ways of getting activists to join other activists, don't work for non activists. I hope people realise that. Giving people leaflets only works to certain, inviting people to public meetings. We need to find better ways. Running all the way around the rose bushes rather than straight down the main path. How do we do that? It's going to be different. But recognising that innovative approaches are far more likely to be at the core of it. And we now have the technology and IT to offer a whole bunch of other approaches that weren't there. We've got space. We've got links between climate change and so many different issues from fuel poverty food growing, to transport, to health, different ways in. And just almost to finish, anyone come across the work of Robert Chambers? <coughs> okay. I can only suggest that you Google him. He's been working on participatory engagement for the last half century. And one of the key points for him, I'm just stressing this final one here, but, but you could actually think about Participation isn't going to work unless we get much better at being participatory. But the challenge about giving up power, if we're serious about in helping in other people get engaged, then they're going to take this away and do it their own way. And we have to recognise the campaigns we take. We have to maintain engagement. Even if we won climate change binding global agreement tomorrow, we've still got 50 years of very heavy weather ahead. Or more. And a lot of community projects don't plan. <coughs> How do we do this? Well, firstly, we talked about funds earlier. Create an organisation that people want to be part of, that enjoy being part of. When did your group last time have a, a, last time a good social? Have we got short term and long term goals? Are we actually? remembering what we did. I was working with a group in Eastern Europe doing some evaluation a year ago. They said, cool, this is really interesting. What are you thinking? <coughs> they were working in their own language and I was having to translate being translated. And they said, we just thought about what we did three years ago. And we were complete crap then. But we recognise it now. We thought we were all right then. But they've taken that time to actually think and look back. And sometimes we don't do that. Especially if things aren't going well. And uh, yeah, review and refresh, what's next? I'm not going to go into this one, because I'm running out of time, I'd like to know. But basically, we should be looking at a point where every 
area in Britain, I think everywhere in the world, has got a climate focused organisation that can sustain itself, can lobby, can be effective. And I can lend you that to anyone wants it. But I'd like to finish really with a quote from that too. Some of you will know that too. I found the Dow 600 BC. We talk a lot about climate leadership. And there's a lot of people in Greece who tend to fancy themselves as leaders. And that's a good thing. We need leaders. But his point is a leader is better than people barely know he exists. And when they have succeeded, they say, we did it ourselves. <laughs> and if you're going to engage people over the next 20 or 30 or 40 years on climate change, and we're going to get out the other side in a relatively large number of pieces, rather than totally fragmented. It is going to be, because people did it for themselves. But the people who are coming to the events like this, I would suggest, are the people who ought to be helping them do it, rather than telling them what to do. And if that sounds slightly the obvious, then um, that's the place to finish. Um, <laughs> any questions or points or violence disagreement? Hmm. I'm sorry, I got a bit lecturing. <laughs> I realised I put too much in. Okay, no one feels okay, uh, just uh, point out that we had the same sort of experience in uh, Balkan with the uh, anti-fracking. It was actually a very Tory council yeah. and area. And uh, what they found actually that uh, yeah, they had to actually focus just on the fracking and say and just talk about it. Um, they were actually NIMBYs, of course, and the ones actually just did, they would, did not want fracking in the area, yeah. didn't care about everybody else's, but that, that sort of uh, slowly turned as the, um, as the camp sort of... Um, stay there for a few months. So it was actually a good way. And now uh, I think they're getting their own, they want to become... Uh, you mean again? Yeah, exactly. It's in, I mean, this Balkan, the, I mean, interesting thing, that yes, a very confrontational thing in a very traditionally Tory area. Yeah. Fairly well managed, little bit of frictions here and there. But I think the long-term outcome about the fact that people there realised some other approach was needed. And now that they're setting up their own community energy supply company, is actually a really interesting example of how you can go from the confrontation to the long-term positive engagement. Yeah. Yeah, just going back to the stuff around engaging more people. Yeah. And uh, one of the things I've been exploring recently is that actually the, what's needed is people who are already engaged to work together. And it's a bit like you've, you've heard of the Northern Division of Innovation, that bell curve, where you've got the innovators. Well, let the innovators start working together. I mean, the late, the late majority, they're never going to be on board until everybody else is on board. So you don't be worried about that. Just start working together and then we can engage the early majority and then so on and so on. But almost in that order. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm helping set up a body called the Community Energy England at the moment, which is so enterprise and not for profit, but desperately realise the need to work together. My only concern is that when we huddle together for all, we actually learn from each other. But we also need to look outwards. One of the things that um, Robert Chambers talks a lot about is when professionals get together for mutual support, they all tend to huddle in a circle. The challenge is to huddle in a circle looking outwards. The traditional professionals will sit around the table, come up with a solution and hang it over their shoulder. How do we actually work together without forgetting what's outside? I think that the key focus is not on coming up with solutions, it's coming up with how to engage more people in uh, a problem that's coming up with solutions. Once you've got all seven people on board, solutions there. I'll go with that. Um, I think what I'll, I'll add to the debate or the, the discussion is um, when it comes to community engagement, I think it's really important to look at yourself if you're doing the community engagement and recognise what positions you're coming from, what <coughs> kind of thinking you're coming from, who you are as a person. And ultimately, are you the best person to engage with this community or this <coughs> group of people? And actually, it might mean that developing experts or people within that community itself is a better way of engaging than you trying to get in. That's really important. I won't do youth groups anymore. I'm <laughs> <not serious. laughs> um, and then why? You know, I mean, there's a kind of whole bunch of. So there's a really interesting example with what community people in Hackney. Borough Hackney working with the Hasidic Jewish community in the north part of the borough. Um, there's a big, big discussion about future housing needs in the borough. And the Hasidic Jewish fam families tend to be large, they tend to have a lot of children. And they're quite a closed community. And they wanted to go in and they thought, how do we get to the Hasidic Jewish community? Obvious. Knock 
a Maduro synagogue. And the um, rabbi said, yeah, sure, you can talk to us. And they said, how can we talk to women? Oh, the women during services, the women are behind the curtain. So I thought that wasn't so good. So, how do you go and engage with Hasidic Jewish women? Where would you find them if you can't find them with the mosque? Anybody? Synagogue. <laughs> Sorry? Find the synagogue. No, you can't. <laughs> Sorry. This is mosque. Uh, get the uh, woman. Um, get but then you've got school gates, absolutely. So, they turn up at school gates, clipboards. What do the women say? Talk to my husband. Absolutely, he's been there. Um, finally, they found two or three women who would talk to them. And as you said, they trained those women up to get them the clipboards. And they discovered there were about 13 or 14 informal coffee mornings, after lunch, after school. There's a whole network of small community organisations that weren't on any list the council had, that had no formal structure, but where people met in each other's houses, and they got a huge amount of information. But it was finding those people from the group themselves and actually giving them the power to run the consultation and the money and the resources that delivered it. So yeah, absolutely. Understand where you are coming from. Anything else? We have two minutes. <laughs> I'm sorry if that ran on a bit, um, but 45 minutes is kind of hard to do a workshop. Um, um, well, I don't know. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, if anyone does want to I'm not sure what's happening about presentations here. Are they all being uploaded? Um, I've got. Okay. It's going to be video and everything else. Yeah, so. I'm sure.